fall, fall semester 2019 of political differences in civility, a dialogue, has the left shifted leftward. Uh, we have Dr. Jerryson from the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, Dr. Fuller from the Department of Politics and International Relations. Uh, we have a little bit of a change in the format. They haven't handed out articles this time. Um, instead, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a coin flip. One of them will go first and speak for seven minutes. Then the other professor will get three minutes to respond. And then the first professor will get two minutes to do a rebuttal to the response. Okay? Gentlemen, ready? There's the, there's the coin. Let's this time. Tail? I'm not sports. What was that? It's heads. All right. So I go first. You go first. All right. Well, I have to hand out something to everybody. If you can just take one. Actually, give can I have one of them? Thank you. Uh, yeah. Actually, I have uh, two things to hand out. There we go. Okay. Uh, so uh, the second one that I've just passed out uh, is uh, a grid that I made in order to talk about the definitional issues separating the left and the right. Uh, if we're going to have this discussion on whether or not the left has moved left, we have to understand what the left is. What is it that we're talking about here? So uh, this may be a kind of a rough uh, outline, uh, but I'll explain along the way how some of this could be a little bit more detailed than what I have here. But for the left, uh, we know understand the left as um, promoting the regulation of economic behavior, so less economic freedom, more uh, support for governmental uh, regulation of enterprise, whereas the right supports a, a laissez-faire approach, uh, economic freedom. Uh, the left believes uh, that society is inherently exploitative, coercive, and prejudiced, while the right believes that there is some value in social hierarchy. The left believes in public sector solutions to problems, uh, with an emphasis on governmental programs and mandatory associations, while the right believes in um, I didn't one. the right believes in uh, private sector solutions with an emphasis on uh, family bonds, voluntary associations, and entrepreneurialism. The left believes in expansion, in an expansion of federal power, more power to the national government, while the right believes in the preservation of federalism, the promotion of states' rights. The left has more of an emphasis, with some exceptions, of course, like Tulsi Gabbard, on uh, global internationalism while the right has a stronger uh, pre preference for national sovereignty, again, with some exceptions there too. Uh, the left believes in freedom from religion. The right believes in freedom of religion. Uh, the left believes in equality measured by outcome. The right believes in equality measured by opportunity. Uh, the left is in favor of social progress, and the right emphasizes a return to tradition. Those are the things that when we talk about the dichotomy between left and right, we're primarily talking about. Now, it's not a perfect encapsulation. Uh, adjustments have to be made, even given the fact that uh, what it means to be left and right is even different according to what society you're in. A British Tory is different from an American Republican. Uh, European conservatives are different from American conservatives in many fundamental ways. And the same is the case for European liberals and left-wing uh, sorts in the U.S. So it's all, it depends upon the society. So that's what we're talking about. And so uh, what we see happening in the United States is a leftward shift towards the, the things toward a, a shift in our politics, uh, both at the partisan level and at the level of, uh, the, of, of, of common uh, thinking, conventional thinking, among the general public, things are tilting, are tilting very much in this direction of supporting uh, things like the regulation of economic behavior and so on, everything that I have listed there. There is still a support for the things that are in the right-wing column, 
but we would see more people over the last couple of uh, generations uh, more in favor of, the, of those things that are on the right wing list. Uh, one of the things that um, the Reagan revolution in the 80s really succeeded at doing, uh, it was um, moderating uh, a trend that was going on in the Democratic Party and creating a more centrist uh, version of the Democratic Party, where you had Bill Clinton and the Coalition for a Democratic Majority, and many of the prominent players in the Democratic Party throughout the 90s and 2000s were supporting that. Now we see kind of a, a shift in the reverse direction, a return back, at least on economic issues, towards um, you know, New Deal kinds of policies. Uh, you know, and perhaps even to, to an extent that it's promoting a stronger government. If you look at the uh, other handout that I gave you, this is from the New York Times, um, from uh, an article that was looking at the uh, shift in the left, uh, and comparing what's happening with the Republican Party uh, and the Democratic Party with what has been happening with the uh, Tory party in England and the Labour party in England, the British counterparts to our two major party systems, what we see is that the Democratic party is moving in a leftward direction and the right wing party, the Republican party, is pretty much staying stagnant. It had a point at which when it, it moved to the leftist most point in 2008, interestingly, uh, it was John McCain running for president that year, who was much more moderate, maverick uh, Republican, and now it's kind of moved back to its, maybe it's slightly further to the right than it was in 2000, but it's pretty much at the same, at the same place. The Democratic Party, on the other hand, has moved very far uh, from 2000 to 2016, and in a, in a very dramatic shift. The methodology that is used to compile this is a look at uh, what they call it, uh, a, a statistical technique called correspondence analysis, in which uh, they're looking at the, the major party platforms, and all four parties, Democrats, British Labor, British Tories, and Republicans, and we see that certain things that are mentioned in their party manifestos are more mirroring things that we see on this list that I, I compiled for you that appear to be much more ideologically left, uh, whereas the Tory and Republican parties have, have, have pretty much stayed the, the same. Well, the Tory party is also, as we see, kind of moved a little bit to the left, uh, especially under David Cameron and Theresa May. Uh, but, 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 the, but most but of those four parties, we see the Democratic Party really, and the Labor Party shifting uh, quite a bit. So we see this happening in both the British and American societies. I'm really interested in finding out why you disagree with this. <laughs> All right, um, thank you, mm -hmm. Dr. Porter. So, first, I cannot believe you took the New York Times at that fake news. I, I tried to choose something that I knew. Just joking. All right, uh, actually, I ended up using the same article in my Did audience. you really? So, yes, I did. Yeah. So, uh, but the thing I want to point out, though, first, is that this thing is comparing different countries and not comparing within this country. And one thing I want to point out from this slide you had, or the hand you have here, is that it talks about how the manifesto moved left, placing greater emphasis on labor groups, equality, and market regulation, 2012-2016. I would say, well, the market crashed because of deregulation. So we have an increase in market regulation in response to that. And because of the attacks on labor unions, which we saw in Wisconsin getting rid of labor unions completely, uh, and other states doing this, you had a reaction. So what I see in these examples is a reacting to, not a pushing of its own initiative. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, well, uh, but I mean, you've taken two examples. Uh, I, you know, I, I would hesitate to say that these are examples of, of necessarily reacting. But what about something like uh, you know student loan forgiveness, where we have uh, you know several of the candidates running that want to forgive student loans, or, you know uh, something like uh, you know like 25 percent, 25 of those candidates 
are supporting the Green New Deal resolution in some way. I'm just using your hand, though. The two out of the three given here just was I saw his reaction. Uh -huh. The other thing, too, because we have limited time, okay. um, I like a lot of these things you put left and right, but I have a question about the second uh -huh. row. Believe that society is inherently exploitative. Uh -huh. What do you mean by the inherently exploitative? Well, that there's a class system in some way uh, in which you Inherently? See, uh, well, it depends upon what you mean by inherent. I mean, I use the word to mean <coughs> that it's systematically exploitative. Well, that the system could change, of course, is the changing. That's what the politics needs to be structured around changing it. See, I don't know if the left people in the left identify as equality measured by outcome. Um, and I don't think, I don't know a lot of leftists, including myself, we think society is inherently anything. Um, but the issue is that we, we see society <laughs> currently as exploitative. And we think that equality should be measured by both opportunity and outcome. But you have just one on one side, one on the other. Um, because, for example, opportunity in a racist society, you don't have equal opportunity because racism prevents equal opportunity from the beginning. But usually people say on the right that they don't examine enough about racism. Yeah. You know, I actually anticipate at this point that you're, you're making now, which is why I don't say equality of outcome. I say equality measured by outcome. So this is how they measure whether or not we have an equal society. How, how many uh, people are represented in various professions or business <coughs> levels and things like that. I mean, I guess time is up with this, right. so I'm. I should go, uh, right? Or no? You well, was... you both have broken the rules <laughs> yet again. We always break the rules. So theoretically, Dr. Fuller now has two minutes to respond to rebut your okay. response. Okay. Oh, we thought it was okay. All right. Okay. Uh, well, I, I think I I did rebut your yeah. your two points there. Yeah. 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 So we can, we can, I'll, I'll yield my time now to, to Dr. Jarvis. So you want to give him nine minutes? Is that it? <laughs> uh, we'll have a greater back and forth. I'm more interested in his argument. That's, um, that's, that's the thing. Yeah, okay, seven minutes. All right, All seven right. minutes. I'll try to do this in seven minutes. My view about U.S. political yeah. effect. Okay. All right, so this is my very uh, general take. I know that it was following from Dr. Lebenz's request to hear more of Jerryson sure. and more. <laughs> So, I try to think of some things in the latter 20th century in the United States, mind you. Concerns I've heard from both the left and the right, and the centuries. By the way, you usually leave out the center, which Dr. Ford did in his. So, concerns on the left, LGBTQ plus rights, race and gender equality, the environment being a big issue, poverty, education, and here's continuing things that are very big concerns for people on the left. Center would be moderate advocacy of issues from either the left and the right, but moderate, not strong. And the right would be family rights, both as freedom, right to bear arms, protection of borders. These are things, here again and again, are things from the right. Uh, but when it comes to economics, the well, left has a strong redistribution of social and political policies for social justice concerns, meaning that because of poverty or education or environment or race or these things, we should redistribute social and political policies to help make it a more level playing field. Uh, Senator thinks there should be some redistribution, but not a lot. And the rights more interested in protection of private property and the deregulation uh, of capitalism, and they be more free, laissez faire, as you put it. In terms of international affairs, so I think it's also a big issue here, um, left thinks that often academic policies and diplomacy should be more important than military action. Center thinks it's some military action, some economic policy diplomacy, but the right generally favors more strong advocacy of military actions in order to ensure U.S. interests. So we, I usually see this as sort of division with left, center, right. Now, getting into presidential positions on the environment in the United States over the last, I'd say, 40 years, we can say this, that Jimmy Carter created solar panels in the White House and when he's in office. Very big in the environment. Reagan removed solar panels when he came into office, but maintained protection of the environment. Bush Senior added regulations for the environment and also removed a few. Clinton added and removed some regulations. Bush Jr. added protections for the environment and removed them. Obama added regulations. Trump appointed Scott Fu to EPA, who was sought to destroy the EPA's regulations. Uh, he removed environmental regulations 
for uh, 1985 regulations about the environment, allowed permission of the Keystone XL in 2017, uh, removed things about covering pollution, oil drilling, extraction, toxic substances, water pollution, among a handful of others that affect industry. So that's what Trump has done. So what I see happening is, over this time period, there's been a deeper cut away from the environment, where Republicans used to be for it, even with Bush Jr. But then later on, is now against it. So the warning was fine under Bush. It was not fine after Bush. Presidential positions on, the edu on education, which I think I'm trying to pick some big things here. Uh, Carter promised the, the NEA would establish the Department of Education, which it did. The Department of Education came out of the National Education Association, NEA. Reagan put in merit paper teachers, 180 degrees shift from the 1970s policies on it, thinking that ex equality to, to access needs and, and access goes to selectivity, regulations to deregulation, common schools to parental choice. This is a moving away from public schools with Reagan, the parental choice here. Bush, however, signed two major laws for people with disabilities, helping to provide more access to all people coming into this, which is huge with the ADA, which you all know about now. Clinton, the goals 2000, eight key, key goals, one to prepare, prepare, prepare young kids for kindergarten through high quality preschool programs, that would increase the number of kids who graduate from high school. Bush Jr., no Child Left Behind Act to improve these things. The law focused on students receiving special education services. We say it failed, but nonetheless, he was focusing on public education. Obama signed the Every Student Succeeds Act, which replaced the No Child Left Behind Act. It doesn't just use test scores or other means to evaluate how school people are doing. And Michelle Obama also tried to increase the food quality for these public schools. Trump appointed Betty DeVos from Amway money who has no education background for part of education, who's pro-charter schools, anti-public schools, divesting from funding the public schools and moving away from the NEA. So we see a greater push away from all these things, including Republicans into this. And going to the same link that Dr. Poehler gave here, from the same article on June 26, 2019, we see that the median party here right now is closer to the mainstream as the Republican Party is the United States. Big shift, we see it in a larger way at these different things. So here we're seeing the Democratic Party being a lot less liberal than all these other ones here in the same article. But we shouldn't compare countries to countries, I think. Last, I want to say that in the 21st century, we see a, a rise in dark money with our politics. David Cook, who passed away just last year, was a 1980 vice president nominee for the Libertarian Party. After he failed, he decided to affect the Republican Party with libertarian ideals, mainly ideals to deregulate so that he can make more money, the Koch brothers. They didn't really care about politics, but deregulate. And what Jay Myers shows exhaustively in this book is that academics, healthcare, environmental protection, and the idea of the laissez-faire free market was used as a means to simply free up the market for the Koch brothers to make more money, which they did from 1990s onward, exponentially, billions of dollars by arguing it's politics when it wasn't from politics, it was from money. Um, to close, I'll say this, that if you go to a, a, a school and you say, look, you're only selling white milk, that's not fair, you're, you're being particular to white milk, we should have chocolate milk too, that would be fair. You just happen to own the cocoa farm. That's manipulating the market. And that's what the cocoa brothers did. They said, ah, hold on, you know these great big like, Rockefeller foundations, that helped out the poor, that's liberal. We should have a balance and make things conservative, which was never the case. It was simply for them to use our money, we regulate and make money, and call it conservative politics. So it's interesting to me that uh, on your list of presidential uh, actions, you started with Carter, especially on the environmental one, because it was actually Richard Nixon who started the EPA. And that's a really interesting movie. How do you begin with Nixon? Yeah. Nixon, I think, it, it, but it was uh, Carter who bestowed the NEA with jurisdiction over the Department of Education, to which now Ray DeVos has said, nope, NEA is not important at all now. Right. So, um, so I agree with you. Nixon was supportive of this. At that point, saying the Republicans have gotten further, further away from where they were before with this, gotten more conservative. The left hasn't gotten more liberal. Mm -hmm. It's the other way around. Don't you think that you're that you're you're isolating a couple of issues uh, in 
not looking at the big picture. Like I, I, mean, I agree with you that on on paper, on, on the on the issue of say of education and uh, the ADA you mentioned and the environmental issues that there that um, that Democrat administrations have not been as successful at succeeding at adopting left wing policies that you would support. Uh, and, and maybe even you're making a case for, for the Republicans being uh, better on those issues. I don't know. Uh, we need to look look that way. But but I'm, I'm just not I'm not I'm not entirely convinced that uh, you know you could just look at their record on the environment or just look at uh, the uh, other issue we have here, which is education. Turn respect the guidance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dr. Fuller, you have a minute and twenty seconds left. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not entirely. I mean, what about um, uh, you know the, the 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 whole vast bulk of social issues that the, the left wing has moved further left on? Um, you know, the, the, all, all, so many social issues. For example, uh, you did not hear about gay marriage in the 1990s. It came out in the 2000s. In the, two th in the 1990s, the big issue was uh, civil unions for same-sex couples, and that was the tolerant position to take. By the 90s, you were intolerant if you supported civil unions because it meant that you were not in favor of, of marriage for same-sex couples. Um, on that issue, in fact, I would say both parties have moved to the left. Um, you know, now you're into the transgender rights uh, movement, which is definitely a movement to the left. We had Hillary Clinton the other day uh, being interviewed with Chelsea, and she shocked, shocked her daughter when she said to the interviewer that, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that, uh, that a transgender uh, man is a woman, right? And, and, and Chelsea was shocked, but this newer generation is obvious, of course, you know, our, our, the norms have changed even within the Democratic Party, a whole vast bulk of social issues, economic issues, as I said before, the uh, uh, Democratic candidates seem to be more in favor of higher taxes on the wealthy, still for a progressive tax, but uh, there, there, there's talk of Elizabeth Warren of a wealth tax, right? Bernie Sanders is talking about something similar. Time has expired. Yeah. yeah All right. Two, two minutes, Dr. Thought you gave me some time. I'm just kidding. All right. I need myself <laughs> All right. So I'll say this. Um, I chose the environment and education to show what I saw were some societal leanings in this country. Usually presidents in the past, I'm not saying Trump, have tried to be more centrist in what they're doing. And what we see is that leading up through Bush um, Jr., that uh, there were, I wasn't looking at who was successful and who wasn't, but that the environment was important. That it wasn't scary, it wasn't this idea of you can't say global warming, but it's a climate change. This was not an issue until the Koch brothers got involved and, and began to make their bad issue. Um, and education is another huge issue. Now, you said social issues. Uh, you gave gay marriages as one example, but that's the only one I can think of that has systemically changed uh, much over the last 40 years. What about abortion? More Abortion's actually more conservative now. We've got states now completely outlawed abortion nearly. Um, it's not about that. It's about the way this country's moving. No, but this question is about the left. It's not about the country. But it's about the way, so if you look at the way the country's moving, then it mo country's moving more conservative, then if the left is staying where it is, it's not getting more left, the country's getting more right. But and that's a different issue. So, and then the other thing is economic issues. Um, we've had Bush and we've had Trump actually who's got a lot of tax breaks to the wealthy. And you're right, Democrats are saying we gotta stop that now, so it's reactionary, but it's not at all. Uh, they're trying to turn to the pre-Reagan era, which did a lot of rolling back of things to try to make things more beneficial to the wealthy and to the privilege. But you're seeing on the abortion, for example, you're still seeing uh, New York uh, passed a law that allows uh, abortion until until birth, right? So nine month old abortions. This is something that the left has moved further left on. It used to be that the you know, pro-abortion movement was for uh, you know like the first trimester and then it's gradually increased. Am I out of time now? Uh, actually, Dr. Jerry's is out of time. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now it's open to the floor. We like to really hear, so we've got Bleeding Heart Liberal, <coughs> Sans Conservative here. You know, we're all listening to each other, but we want to hear from you now. Um, Dr. Jerryson, on your current point of view of presidential positions on the environment, I noticed that you only have included things Trump has done, quote unquote, against the environment, but have not included any um, legislation he has signed for the environment, such as protection of national parks, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, a lot of the protection of the part of the things that came under Obama that became implemented under Trump, he didn't do them. He has pushed for asbestos use again with Russian companies that have already been shown to be dangerous for people, but once it pushed it. He's also opened up huge areas of Alaska and other places, removing protection from parks to allow for oil. And we're now finding more and more destruction for the caribou and other wildlife because of that. Um, so frankly speaking, we can find very anecdotal evidence of Trump doing anything that is not lucrative to a business or himself that has been for the environment since he's been put in office. But he likes to take, Trump likes to take uh, credit for things prior to his stuff. Like for example, the release of the tapes for JFK were done decades in advance and was released when he just happened to be in office. He said, oh, I did this. He didn't do this. So he claims authorship times for things that are not his to be authored. Jacob, well, I want to hear from your students. Anybody? Oh, seriously, yeah. Well, I'm not a student. Hi. Hey. How y'all been? Um, so my question is, um, how what what gives you the idea that the country is actually moving more right? Because I work in politics and I look at the numbers of who actually went and voted. And it's not like an astonishing number of people actually went and voted Republican, but it's a lot of people actually <coughs> did not vote or protest voted. So what what gives you the idea that the country is actually certainly? So here's an example I'll give you for that. Uh, in the last debate for Democrats. Elizabeth Warren was shying away from saying that she raised taxes in middle class. Why? Because Walter Mondale got attacked for that. It was torn apart. And it's become now a no-no. No one can ever say they could raise taxes in middle class, even when we actually need it. Um, and so that's something that's become more and more taboo. Democrats are not playing Republican ball by not talking about raising taxes for everyone this way. They're just talking about the wealthy and the things that are safe now. Um, but they're, they're, they're playing with their playbook that was used to be the Republicans. For example, Obama's um, Affordable Care Act was actually the Republican alternative for health care, not the Democrats. And Obama did this in order to provide a compromise, which was called Obamacare by Republicans, and made liberal when it actually was conservative. So this shows the fact that as we've gotten more conservative, we begin to see reactionary reports by Democrats to try to recapture things like the labor, to get the labor just back in there, and so forth, or to shy away from certain arguments because of these reasons. That's why I would argue this. This is not mean to say that we're all conservative, but I see um, big money interests in Citizens United, uh, corporate interests with the Koch brothers and others, just completely polluting the political spectrum and our news. And that has left the country with much more conservative women's in fear of change. I disagree with you. If I'm, uh, I think that uh, it's the it's the right that's the reaction. Politics is driven by the left, and the right reacts to what the left wants to do. Now there are certain things that are within the political guardrails that do benefit the right. I agree with you. On that. Like for example, the word welfare is a taboo type of term, but if you word it instead as aid to the poor, then everybody is, you know, fine with that, right? So there are just certain words you can't say. Uh, people are okay with, um, in fact, the majority is even supportive of uh, higher taxes on the wealth, but you just can't tax people, right, that, that are going to vote, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, you can't you can't call the left, uh, you know, you can't, you can't call the average voter a basket of deplorable. Right, just like you know, Mitt Romney got in trouble for talking about you know the 49% that are never going to vote uh, Republican at all because they're beneficiaries of some sort of government program. There's guardrails that do in fact 
hinder what Democratic candidates can say. But as this graph is showing, there, in recent years, they've been able to push the boundaries of these guardrails even further than they used to be able to do. The, okay, so you're saying the, that the Democratic Party is pushing the guardrails here. Yeah, they are. The main party's right there, the Republican Party's mm -hmm. way over there, and you think that they're really pushing the guardrails? Yeah, I do. Uh, well, first of all, this, even though I'm using this graph uh, from the same, uh, a graph from the same article, uh, I'm not exactly in a position to criticize the, the, uh, the, the, the argument in the article, uh, but uh, the, what we do have to bear in mind is that this uh, graph only uh, looks at 2016. It doesn't look at the current election. And if you were to tell me uh, back in, in uh, the, you know, the early 2000s that we would have a can you know, five candidates that want to completely wipe away student loan debt, or 25 candidates that support some version of what's in the, the new green new deal, um, you know, I, I would have been very surprised. Like the, the language, the rhetoric, has pushed through the guardrail uh, further than it was even in the last election three years ago. I would agree with that. And uh, I'd say, though, is that it's because things have gotten so bad. Student debt has gotten so bad because of the way Republicans have wanted to do this for so long that finally there is reaction to it. And that the, and that the environment is getting so bad, we're told we got 20, 30 years left, they were getting more and more pushback for this. So it's not because, I think, the fact that they're trying to change, for sake of change, but because Republicans have been pushing this thing. They've been moving this direction for a while, and you begin to get pushback against it, just like with the labor unions have been destroyed across the country, which they have been a bit attacked. And now you have people beginning to push back with, it, with labor. So for me, it's not the fact that they're just simply trying to push things now out of the blue. It's the fact that Republicans have gotten their way in their interests, even under, I think Clinton was a Republican in many ways too, uh, for so long. Uh, and Obama was a centrist by my fair guess, but he's seen as a, a vast liberal, but he's not. Um, I think he's a centrist. So we have not really had a liberal president in a long time. But we have some very conservative people being uh, in, in office for Republicans. So. No, I think we have been, the left has been moving more to the right, and, um... Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't deny the right would shift with the Republican Party. I don't think anybody would deny that the conservative party is truly increasingly conservative. And you talk about, like, um, Obama, um, Hillary, and Bill Clinton. And I, yeah, I agree, they're very much centrist and very much toed the neoliberal line. But, I mean, we're talking about contemporary Democratic Party. I don't, I mean, I don't want to just... Uh, you know, cherry pick uh, AOC or Bernie Sanders, but I do. I mean, I don't think you can like, deny that the contemporary, like younger millennial Democratic voter base and the people that are putting in office and supporting in droves are shifting left at a much more radical pace than the Democratic Party was previously. I would agree with you on this. I would say this though that you, if you went back three years. To seeing the Republican nominees vying after Obama left office, there's a lot of interesting, crazy conservative rhetoric because of the open playing field. And whenever you have a party trying to challenge the incumbents, which is what's happening, you have the ability, especially in the primaries, to speak very liberal, very radical. But when you go into the actual, when who wins who the Democratic Party? Faces off against Trump, it's going to get more centrist. That's just what happens. And so I think we'll see that also. Elizabeth Warren is actually quite centrist. Although she speaks a big talk, um, she is leaning towards a form of neoliberalism that uh, Cornell West and I think is a, a detriment to our society at large. Um, and I say this because like, the documentary 13 shows how the Clintons incarcerated more blacks than any other president did in their administration under neoliberalism. It, it's not really helped in this equality or liberal left issues, but it's been used by Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton and others for a long time. It's been part of the mainstream of the Democratic Party, which again, I think, is why the left has become more right. But I think you're right that when you begin to challenge an incumbent, you do see more radical ideas in the primary. But again, not just cheer, what is the term, the squad, or, you know, the, the sport. 
representatives, but I mean, they're not in the, you know, they're not presidential. And I agree, you know, like you could probably see a Bernie Sanders or, you know, Elizabeth Warren concede certain issues that they were actually from the nominee. I mean, even just in Congress, you're starting to see people that aren't going to be jockeying for president anytime soon that are pushing leftist agendas that are far more left in nature than something I think you've seen 10 years ago. Yes, I think you're doing this in order to get, uh, it's for symbolic purposes mainly, because you, you're getting a lot of discontent in this country for such a strong Republican sort of thing. So everyone's now buying to be seen as the liberal voice. They see it as, as capital, political capital they can grab. So doing something for a purpose, I guess. But if we're going to say about shifts, we can't look in this one small moment for a shift, say it's happening right now. We'd have to take the long delay and look at the last couple of years to do so. Or take this period and look at the next couple of years after this and say, ah, it is moving in that direction. I disagree with you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, and, and we can't just look at the, as, as, um, what's your name? Kevin. Kevin indicated, you can't just look at the uh, presidential candidates. Like, what are the, what, what is going on both in the Democratic caucuses in Congress? what's going on in um, left-wing punditry in the media, we do see a dramatic shift towards the left. I, and I don't think it really, I, I, I think even you're admitting that it is, it's just that you're trying to explain why it's happening. Well, no, I'd say this, the news of the left-wing punditry, as you put it, is, first off, can you ever say that, since you've been alive, that the media has not been left -wing? Well, it always has been. All right, so then, hold on. So then I'll say this, that we've seen in the last 20, 30 years a corporatization of the media. And through the corporatization, I see it actually a weakening of the left-wing country. In fact, you see more of a centrist mainstream CNN, which is, I don't see it all as liberal. Uh, I see MSNBC is crazy liberal, uh, and sometimes I have issues with it because it's, it seems more ideological than anything else. Um, but as you already said, left-wing politics have been around for a long time, so we can't say it's a new thing. But we can't say the corporatization of the media has been around for only 20, 30 years. Um, and that has been a new thing. And that has atrophied progressive thoughts. Absolutely. Um, so we've seen that in, in a big way. Okay, let's uh, open this to another question. So it seems that both of you are using the left and Democrat interchangeably, and the right, or, and or let me, the left and Democrat interchangeable, interchangeably and the Republican Party and the right or the conservative party as interchangeable. And I think that that's a mistake because I don't think that the Democrat and the Republican parties are to the left and to the right. They're to the left and to the right of each other. But when looking at the left, which is what this is about, I, I think that it's a little problematic to look at the Democratic Party, which is probably one of the most far right left parties. So I think that looking at people like AOC, um, Rashida Tlaib, and Bernie Sanders, the people who have been, in Bernie Sanders' case, historically to the left, not just to the left generally, but to the left of the Democratic Party, I think that that might be a little bit more instructive because when looking at the, the two parties, they're very close together ideologically. It's the talking points that come from the far right or the far right and the far left that are more instructive of, I guess, the, the, the push. I don't know if any of that made sense, but. I like that point uh, that you're making. Uh, I have to agree with that, that the idea of left, center, right, which are all relational to themselves, should not be just collapsed into Democratic and Republican parties, which are relational in a different way. And I'll say this, I'm an independent, and I think the Democratic Party is not liberal enough. I haven't. Um, and I'm, yeah, so I would agree with them that way. Um, and I felt more and more like it's become more of a neoliberal <coughs> machine. Um, I mean, you've got yeah, so I mean, you've got a, a party that's based off of racist tendencies of a super delegate system because in the 1970s they were worried about blacks who were running their party so they created a super delegate system to protect that. They still have that there. And everybody's done for the black voters who've actually voted for the people again and again and again. 
and it's a farce. So I am very much frustrated on the Democratic Party, and I don't think we should use it as a marker of the left. So I agree with you there. And I'm equally frustrated with the Republican Party. It should not be a marker of the left. Uh, and, and, and I think that uh, these, camp, these people, like the squad that you mentioned, Bernie Sanders, they might be outliers. And the kind of rhetoric we're seeing now might be outliers within the Democratic Party. I'm not sure of that, given the uh, prominence that they are given by the movers and shakers of the Democratic Party. Do you want to have a follow-up? Yeah. So are the two of you using the Democrat, the Democratic Party to mark the shift left, the shift or lack thereof left? Or are you... I guess it's just more of a question of how the two of you are Well, the, the, the topic for this discussion came up when we were first talking about the election. Right? Should we talk about the election? Right. And uh, it kind of morphed into this uh, question of has the left moved left when I commented on how the Democrats are more left-wing in this race than they normally have been in the past. Uh, but uh, it, but Samantha's uh, question is is good in that right. maybe it's the wrong tact to to have here. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, I mean, I think there's different questions involved, right? If we're trying to chart where these parties are going uh, versus if we're charting what is the left and where it's going. If we take the latter, um, then I'll say that we can't use the Democratic Party as a, as a <coughs> marking point at all for it because it's the left, it's not the Democratic Party. I would, Samantha, just say these are my arguments for the left right here, uh, staunch ways, and the weakening of these interests. When I say about interests by people, I'm not talking about I like this. Everyone says they like equality. The issue is priority. Our administration at YSU says, oh, of course, the women's center should be a nice thing to have, but what's the priority of making it, right? That's a different thing. So when we think about putting money into education, for example, the reason why education is so expensive these days is because we have taken away taxes since the 1980s. States like Ohio used to pay 78, 80% of what YSU has to get for money. Now we get less than 25%. And you know what? The state still gets to tell us what to do now. And they say we can't raise tuition rates, but costs go up each time now. Well, but you can also attribute it to the student loan problem that, you know, everybody can get one. And the university administrations know that. They can charge whatever they want because it's really not technically right now coming out of the student's pocket. No, they can't though, actually, because actually right. they made a law in Ohio saying that you can only raise two or three. But I'm saying here we have this right, two or three percent. And again, the reason why we have these incredible high rates for tuition to get the student loans is because we have taken away taxes for higher education over the last 35 years. And so that's for me, Sam, showing to how education as a concern left in the 70s. After the 70s, it went down. And we've seen it go down ever since uh, in terms of priority. Although we saw people putting things in for bills for these parties, we have not seen it actually get better. Well, we're actually not cutting anything. What we're doing is we're cutting the rate of growth on things. Actually, the budgets increase. But when they cut, all they're doing is they're decreasing the amount that it's going to be advanced higher appropriations next year. That's a Washington, D.C. cut. That's what they call a cut. It's not really a cut. What I mean by, for example, higher education is, for example, the fact that the states don't tax as much within their states, not the federal, states don't. And so then there's less money to be given to universities. So then they have to raise tuition rates. And so what you have is a private bearing the responsibility instead of the public. That's a shift here. Because legal redistribution for social justice concerns, they'll be making sure that no matter where you come from, 
the cost of college would not be that much because everyone's being taxed. That money's going towards higher ed. And that way you have to pay a lot. But now it's no, we, we, we save the pocketbooks of the people that have, especially people who own houses. And because of this, you have to pay more money to go to college, which means the people who have more money have more access to it. And if they don't loans, they don't. So we see a greater stress actually in the middle class and the lower class because of these measures, because of the, the distribution ways, based upon the concerns of the left. But again, it would show the fact that the left interests have not been firmly established and promoted for a very long time. And in fact, now we're talking about the smaller issues, uh, trying to save public education instead of trying to bolster it. It's made the boss to getting rid of gun issues and safety concerns at college campuses because she's got no education background. And she's in charge of the Department of Education because Trump made her stuff. Made her money with Amway. And, and Grand Rapids, Michigan. When you go up there, you can see charter schools galore. And they are not happy with their people. But this is something she did there, and she's going the other way. And you know why? It's because there's money involved in charter schools. Because the public money goes to charter schools to get to decide who they want to let in, instead of letting everyone go in. And that's a big well, issue. I'm not in favor of charter schools, but I am in, I am in favor of, uh, well, I'm okay with charter schools if we've done right, but I'm generally in favor of the voucher program to add competition to public education. But we should probably uh, seek another question if there is one. Chase. Uh, comment first, please. Uh, this time I feel like it was way more engaging. I thought I was attached to the issue more last time and sort of got annoyed when you didn't uh, <coughs> hold Dr. Fuller's feet to the fire by using the Declaration of Independence as a governing document. This time I felt it was like a little more point counterpoint, which was <coughs> a lot more interesting. Uh, but my question uh, is for you, sir, Dr. Fuller. Say I was to buy that the left is moving further left, incorporating Dr. Jarrison's point that it is maybe an answer to the right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even by your own admission, the right has, in some cases, went left. So would you say that the natural state of things is people under a rule for so long are going to expect more from that, and the natural state of things is to move left, we're basically pulling the right out of traditional dark ages? Absolutely. You agree with that? Absolutely. All right, thank you. I, I buy your point then. Mm -hmm. Did you hear his last part? That we're dragging the right out of the dark ages. And then you said, I agree with well, that. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I agree that the right is moving to the left, and the right is in serious trouble of complete demise. <laughs> this is what has happened in the UK, and it's, it is, at least there's indications that it's happening here in America as well that it's just not going to sustain itself forever. I mean, well, what's your the, mill the millennials. What's your evidence? Because if you look at the issues of these concerns, what is freedom? Trump has complete control of right now. They have the Rose Freedom Restoration Act, right to bear arms. Yeah. The NRA has been under attack recently, but they're more powerful than the 70s yeah. by far. Pressure of borders, Trump's getting his way. Family rights are, are we getting, so what, what's, what's? I think the Trump administration is a speed bump of these things, but the millennial generation is just moving so fast to the left that even in the Republican Party, that, that Republican millennials are much further to the left than they would be years ago. The point to where Except for the 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 what? Where are they moving to the left? Well, on, on, the, on, on the religious issues, far, more, far less religiosity on the part of Republican millennials. Um, on uh, the part of um, of uh, on, on international affairs, far more isolationist. And you see this in the Trump administration, less interest in intervention, wanting to instead stay home rather than extend their military out places and really be the police of the world. There's this mindset now which has led to the Trump Trump ascendancy that we already see happening there. All right, so you gave, for example, religion and isolationism. Mm -hmm. I'll say this, Jimmy Carr was the first president to explicitly make use of religion and he did so as a Southern Democrat, and opened that up. Reagan took it and went, and we didn't see it come back since then. But religion has only been a recent phenomenon for both parties in the way it's been used. And I would think that there's a lack of religion on both sides, and I don't think one says liberal or left or right in that way. But well, the Freedom Act and the money behind it and the infrastructure and the policies behind it are stronger than they've ever been before in, in D.C., thanks to Trump. 
Isolationism is a Teddy Roosevelt issue that is not democratic, and it's not leftist either. It's not, so I don't think they're moving leftist there. It sounds like more like apathy. Uh, but well, you asked me uh, how is this changing. Is right, but this is not diplomacy and policies. That's just isolation. That's not making it go left then, in my view. That's just changing what, what it is on the right then, but it's not making it go left. Mm -hmm. Because left wouldn't be isolationism. And left wouldn't be getting rid of all religion, because there are many liberals who are very religious. It's about the issue of how you talk about religion. Can you ask, just sort of taking a step back, I'm confused by this idea of left and right. I mean, these topics were introduced in 19th, 19th century France. And we go, OK, this is how we divide our political spectrum. At some point, context matters. You're all accusing the other, each other of their sort of parties be needing to react, right? The right reacts because the left always changes, which is the imagination that there is some tradition to which they're holding and not inventing on the spot and rearticulating on the spot to serve present purposes. Uh, I think Michael made, made, made a similar argument, right? What if we drop that? What are the frameworks? Like, what are the what are these frameworks? We're looking at policy points. So the environment, but the environment meant something different 40 years ago when we didn't have the data that we have now, when it wasn't in as bad a case as it is now. But what about frameworks of analysis, right? And I think the closest point in this question is with these two questions here, right? We are now talking about socialism in the Democratic Party. That, to me, seems like a shift to the left. When I was growing up, when we were growing up, uh, during, the cold, during the end of the Cold War, socialism was a bad word, right? Now socialist is something where there are clubs and meetings and, you know, fights on Thanksgiving dinner, but no one's tossed off the democratic stage. And on the right, I, I, would, I would, because of this contextualist thing, I would think it's a right or a, a left or a shift. I think the economic fundamentals supporting neoliberalism are bunk and, fall, and collapsing upon themselves so the Republicans are having worse votes, right? So why this framework of left and right, which is ostensibly meaningless and essentialist? Um, I had a lot of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I still think that we could categorize <laughs> these two competing political movements. Would you, you want to continue going in left and right? No, I, don't just I actually per, prefer you know, progressive versus conservative. That's probably the better terminology for it. You don't, you don't think that, that some kind of categorization like this even exists? I think it's necessary, but I think a lot of it's aesthetics. Uh, which is what was uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Jerryson's point about Warren. In terms of socialism, uh, first I think you should keep in mind that when we had McCarthyism in the 1950s out of Wisconsin, it was the Red Scare, and communism was made into the, the devil, demonized. Uh, and so out of that, we had a, a very big issue of not talking about socialism. What happened over the last 10 years is that when you begin to progress arguments, the Republicans are called socialism to torpedo the Democrats when they're talking about because they're using it. What's interesting is that recently, the Democratic Party used, is used socialism in the way that the, the LGBTQ have used queer. They've reclaimed it. And they said, OK, yes, it's socialist. And they're not at all trying to shy away from it now. You want to call us that? Fine. We're pushing this. And so what I see is a weathering down of the use of trying to scare people with this term that was used by Republicans early on, saying that's socialism, that's what we're doing here, uh, that was done during Kerry's run for office and so forth. Um, and so there's a lot of fear in politics. And socialism was used in this country since the 1950s as a point of fear. We're losing that now. But when we actually examine the policies that are called socialist, I'm not too concerned about it because think of this. Our post office is socialist. Everyone pays the money. Same amount of money, everyone gets the mail. The fire department, socialist. The police department, socialist. If you want to go down to shared resources and how it all helps out the community, that's what it is, but people. The library, socialism. Socialism is given by, by a whole different thing, right? A collectivized society. Post office has competition, private competition. Everyone has the post office and gets to use it. Everyone gets to use the library for that purpose, too. 
We have elements of socialism in our country. Well, we've always had. State service. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, who's, yes. Uh, I mean, I don't deny that socialism was, you know, the boogeyman of American politics. And, you know, we already have some socialist aspects, you know, in our government now. And I'm not saying Bernie Sanders is like a, a Marxist-Leninist, but wouldn't you agree that, like, the policies being espoused by people like Bernie, by people like AOC, while not full-blown Marxists, are more socialist than what you've called uh, the neoliberal machine that the Democratic Party line is currently being towed? I mean, by very nature, those policies are already more left than what the Democrat, Democratic Party has been pushing out for the last 30 years. I mean, the agenda that's kind of on the forefront now is just more left than what it's been. I will agree with you on this, that yes, the Democratic Party right now is speaking more left than they've been for the last, uh, for a while. But if you look at the 70s, they're actually still more tempered than they were in the 70s. Um, and Reagan did a lot of resurfacing in this country for what we thought was normal. He was a actor, he was charismatic, and he pushed forth a lot of things that hurt welfare, that hurt all these things, that helped the white elites, that helped out, that hurt education and therapists and so forth, mental health. Um, and it's conservatives like him a lot, that's fine. Um, but we're seeing people become tired of this trend that has left since the 1981. And there's pushback now. So I would say back to the 70s now, is that more left than it was before that? No. Is it more left than maybe 10, 15 years ago? Well, sure, but Trump was a lot more different than the Republican 10, 15 years ago, right? People are fed up with the system. And that's why they're looking for change. And they voted for change with the Republican Party, with Trump. Now, Democrats are trying to push their sense of change, which, who knows? But I see it as just the same sort of drive, wanting change, persistence, failing. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, the parties are becoming increasingly polarized and moving more respectively. I mean, it's kind of hard to find left and right. But, I mean, I just, I mean, so you would say that the Democratic Party, maybe not as left as it was in, you know, historically, but, I mean, it is embracing some form of a bit of a leftist change. I would think that some people are becoming more emboldened right now, but I want to remind us that that's because of how right everything is shifted. So their leftist things, again, are in line with the 1970s leftists. It's not more than that. But they're seen as socialist because of this. It's just such a very different view of our society than I have. I see everything is moving far f further to the left, we, and, and there's a pushback to those things. I see a society in which, you know, we're, we, it's, the United States is, it's harder to start a business in the United States than in communist China, because like we're way down on the list for economic freedom. We have a government now that, that uh, has the ability to tell us what we can and cannot do with our property, the values that we are required to teach children. I mean, it, the list goes on of the, of the, of the decline of, uh, of, of conservative values in America. And uh, everything seems to be going in the direction of, of the left. And the, the right is trying to push back against it, but uh, I don't think so. I, don't, I mean, we have a, a, a temporary speed bump on, on some of this with the Trump administration. But even with some of it in the Trump administration, it's an exacerbation of everything that the left has done. So there's even a, uh, a right wing uh, uh, you know, disgruntlement you know, taking place with Trump. Well, well I want to, I want to, I'll just probably get back before the last word here because we are out of time. Uh, and we wanted yeah. to announce the fact that our next debate is going to be on whether or not there is enough cause and justification for an impeachment take place against President Trump. So we're going to be having that debate. The question won't be, should Trump be impeached? Right, but is there enough sufficient evidence to necessitate there be an impeachment process? That's what we'll be debating upon next month, and we thank you for your questions and for your interest. Thank you.